it is important for us to realize that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who were the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they, the majority of them were mushrikeen prior to entering the fold of Islam as per the propagation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does forgive shirk. So what is the confusion? Because we have a verse of the Quran, Allah says, Allah will never forgive someone who engaged in shirk, association of partnership with Allah. But besides that, he will forgive anyone and anything as he wishes. He can forgive anyone who has done anything, anything. But he says, when it comes to shirk, I won't forgive it. And how come we see that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the bulk of them were mushrikeen. So where is this explanation? The truth is, this verse and verses of this nature are connected to the condition upon which you die. So if you died upon a condition, then that verse comes into application. While you are alive, no, even if you committed shirk, Allah will forgive you if you ask the forgiveness. The mercy of Allah is so vast, you will cry if you think about it. Allah says that when you die, if we see that you have committed so many sins that you did not seek forgiveness of, if you did not commit shirk, we might just forgive you completely and tell you go to Jannah. Even though you did not seek forgiveness. It's got to do with the condition upon which you died. So Allah says, if you die and I see you have committed no shirk, there is a chance that I might just say, you know what, this person will go to Jannah. Allah says, I will forgive whoever I want, whatever I want. But if you have committed shirk, and you died on the condition that you did not seek forgiveness from the shirk, then Allah says, I will be very, very upset with you because you, I created you, I made you, you chose to worship someone or something besides your creator. You failed your test. So this is what we need to understand. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, a lot of them, like I said, the bulk of them, they were mushriki, subhanallah, they used to worship idols, they used to worship things, they used to worship other human beings sometimes, they used to worship all sorts of items. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever seeks forgiveness, he forgives him. Do you want to hear a beautiful hadith? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man taba, taba Allahu alayhi. Amazing how the Arabic wording is. Taba, whoever seeks forgiveness, Allah forgives him. This means never doubt when you seek the forgiveness of Allah that Allah has not forgiven you. Don't doubt that. Meaning don't doubt by thinking that Allah has not forgiven you. Don't ever doubt the forgiveness of Allah. No matter what you've done, if you were alive, you sought the forgiveness, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Now, this evening I want to go through a few examples of the concern of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who were Muslimin, now they were Muslims, and then they did a few wrong things. They were concerned. How that concern drove them to seeking the forgiveness of Allah. They were very lucky. Why were they lucky? They were lucky because they had the best of creation in their midst. They had revelation that used to come from the skies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to reveal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, telling him, I love Abu Bakr, subhanallah. I love Umar, subhanallah. Amazing. Umar is in Jannah. Abu Bakr is in Jannah. Uthman is in Jannah. They were so fortunate. Imagine if we were told that. I always think about it and I say, Ya Allah, you know, we, will, we, we are not told that for reasons, subhanallah, for reasons. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But still, they were lucky because when they did something wrong, they could go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and say, O oh, messenger, 
We seek the forgiveness of Allah and we ask you to seek for us the forgiveness of Allah. So Allah says, if the Prophet ﷺ seeks forgiveness for someone, Allah will forgive him unless, unless he was an outright hypocrite. Like Allah says in the Quran. Hypocrites. A particular person from among them was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He pretended to be a Muslim, but he was not. He used to spy, he used to hurt the people, he used to try to divide the Muslims, he used to want the Muslims to turn away from Islam. So Allah exposed him so many times. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu can I beat him up? Can I execute him? Can I inflict harm on him? On him? And the Prophet ﷺ used to say, don't do that. We don't want people later on to come and say, Muhammad used to persecute his companions. ﷺ. We don't want that. This is why even though he was a clear hypocrite, the Prophet ﷺ refused for anyone to harm him. And then he died one day. When he died, the Prophet ﷺ, was called obviously to fulfill Salatul Janaza. Now I want to tell you something interesting about that particular time. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever there was a Janaza to be fulfilled, they used to, they used to obviously want him to lead the Janaza because the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not like yours and mine. If he makes a dua, it has a different value. It's not like anyone else's. So they would want him to come. He would seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this particular person who passed away. And it would be a means of blessing that the Prophet sallallahu made a dua for them. But he used to ask a question. You know what the question was? He used to say, Does this person owe anyone anything? If they said no, he said, Allahu Akbar. He started the salah. If they said yes, he would turn around, walk away and say, Sallu ala sahibikum. He says, this man owes someone something. You people do the janazah, I'm going away. This hadith shows us how severe and serious it is to be owing people things. Try and sort it out as soon as possible. Because even to borrow from someone, it is a last resort in Islam. I hope we understand this. We've spoken about it in the past. When we borrow from people, it should only be a last resort because I promise you, if you die in a condition where you owe someone something and it was already owed, you see there are two types of debts. One is a debt where someone gave you time to pay. For example, a person says, look, I lend you a thousand, you need it, pay me after two years. If you died after one year, it's not your fault. They take out the money they can give the person. But if the, the two years passed and they are following you, then you pass away. It's a problem. The same applies to Hajj. My brothers, my sisters, let's listen to this. People say, I owe $20,000 still for my house. How can I go for Hajj? My brother, your house and your business, a lot of the people who are absolute millionaires, they owe huge amounts to the banks because, you know what? They have taken overdraft. Today, I don't want to speak about halal and haram. We're talking of a reality on the ground. And they will tell you, I owe the bank so much money, how can I go for Hajj? But they're driving the latest vehicles, they're living in the top houses. So let me explain to you, two types of debts. You have one where you owe it immediately. People are following you because it's overdue. If it is overdue, you cannot go for Hajj, you must first pay your amount. But if it is not overdue and you have been given 20 years to pay, two years to pay, five years to pay, you make sure that you have enough that during the time of the Hajj, the amounts you will be owing have been covered. How much electricity bill will be for so many months, it will be covered. What your water bill will be, will be covered. What your expenses and costs for food will be, will be covered. Even though you owe 200,000, your Hajj is still farad on you if you have that type of a debt where it's not immediately overdue or due. I hope we understand this. So if someone, if I owe someone 200,000, when big business men do business, a lot of the times they are owing through their whole life. It doesn't mean that I don't go for Hajj. 
I need to ask myself, is it current or is it a long-term debt? If it's long-term, for as long as the time I'm going to be away, nobody's going to be searching for me and hunting for me. Nobody's going to be, you know, owed something during the time I should be going for Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. So going back to the Prophet sallallahu he used to ask this question. When the Muslims became wealthy and Baytul Mal became so, so filled with, with wealth, the coffers of the Muslims were full. You know what? Things changed. A lot of people don't talk about this, but things changed. The Prophet sallallahu says, whoever left a debt, I will pay it on his behalf. Subhanallah. So what has changed? What changed is when there was someone to pay it on your behalf, it was okay. The Prophet ﷺ would come and he would fulfill the janazah. It has happened where the Prophet ﷺ says, does he, have, does he owe anyone anything? They said yes. So as he's walking away, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu says, Oh Messenger, I will pay that debt. Then he would walk back and do the janazah. This is how serious it was. But when the Muslims became wealthy, in, in the Muslim lands became very wealthy. Like I said, the coffers were filled. Then what we call the Ministry of Finance today would actually pay the debt of everyone. A few days ago, I read an article in the paper where the Amir of Kuwait, this is a reality. I'm just mentioning it just to show you that it does happen. He made an announcement to say anyone who is jailed because they owe someone money, we will pay that money for them and release them. This was a few days ago. You can read it in the papers. It has happened. So this goes to prove that from the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ's time, that was the custom. If the country is very wealthy, a man who is in jail because he owes someone a little bit of money is not necessarily a huge criminal. Obviously, each case needs to be studied. But sometimes he must have gone through some problem, some difficulty, some issue, something went wrong, you know, maybe a deal went sour, etc. So in that case, look, money is money. If they, the nation had it, they would give it. And this is what would happen to the Muslimin. Now let's go back. This man, Abdullah ibn Ubay, the Prophet ﷺ initially did not used to read only on those who owed people money. Then when this man passed away, he was a hypocrite. The Prophet ﷺ, he knew this, that this man here, he didn't owe anyone anything. He came in the front and some of the companions had a slight bit of a question. It's not called an objection because it's the Pro Prophet ﷺ, but a question. What's the question? Oh, messenger, you want to lead Salah, Janaza on this man, but he was an open hypocrite outright. You know how much damage and harm he did to Islam and the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ says, I will fulfill the janazah for as long as Allah does not stop me. If Allah stops me, I will walk away. Because revelation is life. Life meaning like the electricity is life. Revelation could come and go anytime. So if Allah didn't stop me, I'm fulfilling my duty. I'm supposed to. So he got up and he fulfilled the janazah. And he sought, he was Obviously, subhanallah, it was something big in the hearts of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu because this man harmed Islam so much that they felt the Prophet ﷺ should not have been there. Then Allah revealed these verses. Seek forgiveness for them or don't seek forgiveness for them. If you seek forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah will never forgive them. Why? Because they were hypocrites. They, were, they did not seek forgiveness. Now, a very interesting question arises. The Prophet ﷺ received verses from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding not making salah on the hypocrites after that day. So what happened? Verses came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Muhammad sallallahu <laughs> Don't ever fulfill Salatul Janazah on any one of the hypocrites and don't even stand at their gravesides. Now, 
who were the hypocrites? Because now people would say that one's a hypocrite, this one, that one. Any small problem you got with someone, you report him. He's a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. Like what happens today, a person has a problem with you and he knows that you might be an innocent person in something. Some, to make your life difficult, he reports you to this one, to that one, to that one. This was not seen in the Muslim ummah before. But today, people have become cheap. They want to harm you even in a way that you don't deserve. Not realizing that Allah will catch you. You might run away in the dunya for a little bit, but Allah will get to you. Allah's noose is tied straight on your neck. When he pulls a little bit, you won't even know how to breathe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So that's what was the worry. So Allah solved the problem. You know what he did? He gave a list to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Here's the hypocrites by name. One, two, three, four, all the list went down. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa knew who they were by name. Now, something more interesting would happen. Every time the Prophet ﷺ was not at a janazah, the Sahaba used to say, you see, that guy was a hypocrite. You see, are you following what I'm saying? Because now he had the list. Now there was a new issue. News started spreading amongst the Sahaba that there is one Sahabi, the Prophet confided in him and told him, Ya Hudayfa, his name was Hudayfa bin Ibn al-Yaman. He says, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, I am telling you the list, but don't tell the people the list. Now, there was a reason for this. Right? Up to today, we don't know the list because he didn't tell anyone. He said, I couldn't tell. You know, sometimes we hear a story, and this is, this is something on a lighter note, right? You hear a story and they say, you know, this Maulana called the other Maulana and told him, don't ever tell anyone this story. And then he told him this, I have a question. How did the story come to you and me? That's a question. Because that means someone somewhere cheated. Because if that man told that man, don't tell anyone, then that man was a cheat. Because how did he tell the people for the story to come to me? But this doesn't happen with the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. It never ever came to us. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was a mountain. You know that he was a mountain, the second most powerful person in Islam after the Prophet sallallahu He was worried. He says, I hope I'm not a hypocrite. Imagine with us, the way we, we, have we ever thought hypocrisy? May Allah forgive us. You know, may Allah forgive our sins. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Keep seeking the forgiveness of Allah. You will attain the mercy of Allah. Every day, just seek the forgiveness of Allah. You will have a cool, calm life. You must be convinced that I asked Allah's forgiveness. He has forgiven me. I'm clean. No matter what you've done, you must be convinced because that's the teaching of Rasulullah Wasallam. He says, forget about your past. Forget about what you did. Forget about what you did earlier today. No, the fact that you are asking, oh Allah, I'm your worshiper. I cannot face punishment from you. Forgive me. I've done wrong. I admit I was weak. I will not do it again. Allah says, I forgive you. That's the whole idea of worship of Allah. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, as powerful as he was, he wanted to know. He says, I want to ask you, Ya Hudayfa, about the list. I need to know who's on the list. He says, I can't tell you. He says, no, tell me. I need to know who's on the list. And then he says, look, I cannot inform you about who's on the list because I've told the Prophet ﷺ that I won't. He says, okay, minimum, tell me, is my name there? He says, your name is not there. Subhanallah. Did you hear that? Minimum, tell me, is my name there? He says, no, your name is not there. So he didn't give him the list. But from that, we now know that Umar ibn Khattab was not a hypocrite. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Because later on somewhere, people would come and swear Abu Bakr and swear Umar and call him a hypocrite, not realizing that for there was a reason why years back he asked, um, is my name on the list? And Rawahul Bukhari, it says his name was not on the list. Subhanallah. You follow? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do you know what he says? According to one of the narrations, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that I was sent as a mercy. Listen to this. I was sent as a mercy to all the creatures, not just to mankind. I was sent as a mercy. Allah says, if you seek forgiveness for them 70 times, I will not forgive them. If I knew that by seeking forgiveness for them 71 times, they were going to be forgiven, I was going to seek that forgiveness 71 times. But what was meant by the verse was that no matter how much you seek, you cannot. Why? Why is it that 
The Prophet ﷺ is going to ask for forgiveness for these hypocrites and Allah says, I won't forgive them. Why? There is a reason. Let me explain the reason. It is the same reason that Allah told Ibrahim السلام, that your father don't seek forgiveness for him. But now why? Because he was an enemy of Allah. He chose his path. Now let me explain it to you with a powerful example that is simple, but it will bring it to your mind. You have a child. If your child does something wrong at school, they did it once, they did it twice, they did it three times, and the school expels your child or suspends them. Right. If the child says, Dad, I'm sorry, I really regret, I really feel it's bad what I did, and I want to go back to the school, you can take your child to the school and you will tell the headmaster that, you know what, my child is apologizing. My child is apologizing. In that case, the headmaster might say, okay, look, you know what, no problem, let's take him back. Right. But what if the child does not apologize? The child did not want it. The child says, I was right. And if you send me back, I'm going to do the same thing again. Then no matter how much the father cries to the headmaster, the headmaster will say, you're a fool. You are seeking forgiveness for a child who doesn't want that forgiveness. They chose something else. They are telling you, you are wrong. If we bring them back, they're going to do it again. We, are, we, we would be foolish to take them back. Because the remorse needs to come from the criminal himself. You follow? So Allah says, if a person died on kufr, they chose that life. Why should you interfere between me and him now? By saying, oh Allah, forgive them. Allah says, you're wasting your time. Because they did not want the forgiveness you are asking them for. They chose a different deen. They chose a different life. They chose a different system. They did whatever was wrong and considered it right. And after they are gone and the test is over, you want us to give you back their test papers to say, right, you fulfill here and we're going to listen to you. No way. That's not how it's going to happen. Allah says, the kuffar, leave them. It's between me and them now. You don't have to ask for forgiveness for them. Some people say, why does Islam not allow me to seek the forgiveness of someone who was not a Muslim who passed away, who was a relative of mine? That's because they don't want your forgiveness. They never ever wanted it during their lifetime. Why do you want to offer it to them when they still don't want it? They've died and they chose something totally different. Leave them to their beliefs and to their maker. He will deal with them. That is the explanation. It's not unjust. It's not unfair. It's fair. They chose the path. So the minute you know, I give you one example. A certain brother passed away suddenly with a heart attack a few months ago or a month ago. And I used to know this brother. And I wanted to seek his forgiveness from Allah. And someone told me this brother was not a Muslim. I said, no. On his WhatsApp status, he had a key. And it says the door to Jannah is Salah. And he had a person in sujood on that particular WhatsApp status. For that reason, I will consider him a Muslim and I will ask Allah, oh Allah, forgive him. Because there is a sign that he was a Muslim. Do you get what I'm saying? We don't want to remove them from Islam. But I said, oh Allah, forgive this brother and give him Jannatul Firdaus. Because there is a sign he was a Muslim. If there was no sign whatsoever and you knew for a fact that this person died outside the fold of Islam, then perhaps you leave it between them and Allah. You don't need to interfere now. Rabbun wa abdun, meaning it's Allah and his worshiper, his slave. On one hand, if you're a believer, and if it's someone else, it's Allah and his creature. Allah made him. Let him sort that matter out. So these are some of the lessons we learn from the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Beautiful, powerful lessons. I want to end with one more. One more. You know, there was a battle that took place known as the Battle of Tabuk. That Battle of Tabuk, there was an announcement made that every able male should go out. Whoever doesn't is a hypocrite. Or if you, if you have an excuse, it's okay. But if you don't, that's it. So there were people who stayed behind. Some people were encouraged by their friends to stay behind and so on. The Prophet ﷺ was not really too worried about the hypocrites because a hypocrite, even if he came out with you, he would, his actions would actually cause more harm to you than anyone else. Sometimes it's better to have a guy who doesn't know much away. When I say no, doesn't know much, I'm talking of say your workplace. You have three people, you need to go and sort a problem out. Now, one guy really doesn't know anything at all. You'd rather leave him out than for him to come and make a mistake here. You see, so the same applies 
when it comes to the deen, such an important thing like the Ghazwat Tabuk, the battle of Tabuk, let's take with us the best of our men, subhanAllah. So when Allah puts it in the heart, don't go, there's a problem. However, there were three people who did not go because of laziness. What was laziness? They said, yeah, we're going to prepare tomorrow. We'll prepare, we'll prepare, we'll see, we'll do. One guy was busy with his business. The other guy was busy with something else. A third was busy with something else. And in the process, the army proceeded. They were left behind. They stayed behind. And you know what happened? What happened is they really regretted it so much, so much that they cried about their absence in Tabuk. The Prophet ﷺ asked about them. And Allah revealed verses to say, don't talk to them. They were regretting. And for 50 days, no one spoke to them. Minimal, within a limit, after that it became worse and worse. And after 50 days, according to the narrations, Allah sent down verses saying, we have forgiven those three. Now, why am I raising this? Because my brothers, my sisters, when I commit a sin, when my laziness makes me delay my salah to the degree that I missed it, astaghfirullah, may that not happen. Do I or am I prepared to be pushed into a corner until I'm really throttled to earn the forgiveness of Allah? I'm not even sometimes conscious of the fact that I sought the forgiveness of Allah. And these people for 50 days, the Prophet ﷺ went to their wives and told them, separate from these people. I've been instructed. Other people would have left the deen. Wallahi, the messengers came from the Christians to them to say, look, you people are being boycotted. We are welcoming you here. That was a test for them. So the point I want to raise and I want to end on it is, Allah will test you. With what? With sin. What does that mean? Allah will test you with sin to see if you have committed it. How quickly are you going to go back? And what are you prepared to do to start making a good relationship with Allah after that sin? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah make us from those really who can work to please Allah. You no matter what sin you have done, Allah will forgive you on condition that you are serious about your relationship with Allah. And trust me, you will smile all the way, all the way. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa 